Good afternoon. Today we have a lecture on self-supervised learning, but not like the classic self-supervised learning, which we focus on the losses and how to build uh, pairs of samples for contrastive learning. But we will actually like look a bit more wider and see how we can learn very rich um, representations with no annotations, but kind of exploring another perspective of self-supervised learning. So allow me to share the screen first. Oh, got it. Good. So first, I would like to acknowledge uh, our students, Amanda Dida, Kamaya, Rita, and Christina, as well as Jordi Pons, who have helped me in, into learning and getting familiar with all these topics. So let's start with the motivation. Um, so maybe at this point, you kind of have grasped the idea that uh, with neural networks, we can process any type of, of data. Maybe in our lectures, we tend to show many examples on, on images and vision problems, but actually nothing prevents you to apply deep neural networks to any kind of data. One other type of data that's very popular where deep neural networks are very, very popular, to, to process audio or speech or music, okay? So there are like architectures that can both uh, encode, like would be uh, to analyze audio signals as well as decode them, also to generate them, okay? And, and, and this encoder and decoder architecture, they will be uh, built on the same networks that you have already seen, whether convolutional, recurrent, whether tension uh, layers, graph neural networks, um, the architectures, you already know them, okay? And um, today I will be, this lecture is more like on top, and kind of, once you have an architecture, like what, how can we learn uh, rich representations? But today we'll be combining two modalities. We'll be combining vision, or we'll be combining audio. So why is that? Um, what is very interesting between the visual and audio modalities is that we have such a huge amount of data in which the visual and the audio modalities, they are synchronized. So whenever we record a video, when I mean video, I'm talking about both about the audio uh, track and both the visual track. We have these two modalities that uh, provide some information about the world, which are perfectly synchronized in China. And this temporal synchronization both from both modalities, which actually is very natural, that's uh, these are two of our most important uh, perceiving senses, right, that we have as humans. So as we have all this huge amount of data, whether on videos on YouTube or any other type of video, um, it's a, a great um, scenario in which we can apply, apply self-supervised uh, learning techniques. But now uh, the self-supervised paradigm, now it will mostly go from one modality to another, okay? so. Um, most of the vanilla examples that I will present today, we're going to have vision at the input of the network, and we will have like kind of audio representation of the output, or vice versa, or vice versa. And then we'll also start combining different um, variations of these setups. So let's start uh, first. Uh, going to go like two main approaches to do self-supervised learning uh, for audio and visual. Accused. The first one will be like the most classic one, more related to what you have seen so far. Like, okay, what if I want to learn features? And that's my final goal. My goal is learning features. And then later at the end, at the second part, I will really look at application, which the 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 fact of going from one modality to another, that's the task that we want to solve, that we want to solve. Okay. So the what we have seen so far on self-supervised learning is more related to this feature learning part that we will address now. So what have we seen so far on self-supervised feature, feature learning? So uh, you have already seen in previous lectures that self-supervised uh, feature learning is a form of unsupervised learning where we are going to use raw data to provide some supervision in such a way that we learn some valuable representation from our data. In order to do that, we'll need uh, two different tasks. One task is called the pretext or surrogate child, and that's the one that basically that we need to uh, 
design in such a way that we can learn valuable information by having a huge amount of unlabeled data. Later, we're going to have um, another task that's going to be called the downstream task that will exploit the representations that we learn with the pretext task and with these proxy laws that we will create. And the downstream task is the task that we really want to solve. Okay. But basically here, the story is that we're interested in learning representations in our neural networks that are rich, that are useful to solve another task. So we'll be really focused on the pretext task and the proxy loss. And we, for doing that, we will just have data that is not labeled. Okay, so we uh, will not use labels when learning the pretext task. We will only use labels when uh, assessing the downstream task. So the, the, the task that for, for which normally we don't have much label or, or any at all, or just a very few, um, that's that later. Let's, let's see what can we do with Orient visual strings. As in previous lectures, uh, when we approach self-supervised feature learning, uh, there were like two big families of uh, solutions and that's the same here. We're going to look at some solutions that work on the, in which the loss is measured on the output space. That these are the generative or predictive uh, solutions. And on the other hand, the contrastive uh, solutions and approaches or approaches in which we are comparing uh, data points and trying to do samples representations and try to make them close or 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 split them apart in, in our representation space. Okay, so we're just going to look at the both types of ways of doing self-supervised learning, but again, today by combining audio and visual information. Let's start with first with the generative and predictive methods. So these ones on the left, uh, these ones are like kind of the easiest to understand because we have like some data at the input and we get some data at the output. And as I mentioned today, one of them is going to be vision and then the output is going to be audio or vice versa, whether we're going to fit audio in our network and expect to have some visual uh, data at the output. So let's first look at solutions in which we have pixels at the input and audio representations at the output. So there have been quite a lot of works and many of them are from this team, from Antonio Torralba and Will Freeman at MIT. And they kind of started this um, broad uh, field now in 2016 with this work in which what they were doing is like uh, giving a uh, training or network in which uh, by giving a video frame, he asked the network to predict some statistics about the audio features, okay? Here, the, the basic idea that, they, that we're trying to explore is, like, is that um, pixels, they are kind of related to some ambient sound, okay? And that neural networks can be trained in a self-supervised manner by doing that. And, and we can really learn uh, how to more or less predict the ambient sound given an, an image. Right, so it, or if, if you see one of these image, you can expect that the ambient sound of, uh, of let's say, maybe it looks like a, maybe it's a bar or, or like a, uh, a place where people are chatting. You, get, you in this kind of setup, you expect people speaking. While in this other setup, it's outdoors. Uh, there is the sea. There's nature. You expect other kind of ambient sounds. And that's the kind of uh, this cognitive power that we want to uh, obtain with our network. So in this first work, what they did is like, okay, they trained a neural network. They had a uh, large amount of video recordings, both the pixels, both the uh, audio tracks, and they uh, use, they pick up manually some statistics about the audio. Okay, I think it was the energy and something else that I can remember, but you can check the paper, some, some statistics about, about the audio. And then they train a neural network that given at the input, uh, the pixels, of the video, they were trying to predict the statistics of the audio that were kind of centered on that video frame. Then when they learned from the neural network to do that, what they did is they um, took an, a test set. So first they, they take a training set to estimate the parameters of the neural network, and then they take another data set. They fit the um, 
video frames of the test set onto the network that was trained, and they look at the audio stats that were being predicted. Based on these audio stats, they cluster them. And so they apply a cluster algorithm like k-means. So they build groups based on, based on the audio statistics that were predicted from the video frames. And here in this example, these qualitative results, you see like there are like three uh, rows. Each row corresponds to frames of the videos that were clustered based on the audio stats that were predicted. So notice that these clusters that we see, like one for each row, they are based on the audio statistics that were predicted for the for video frame that you see. As you can notice, there are like some semantics that uh, are querying across the video. So the first uh, row, there's, there are quite a few images where the, uh, the C is shown. In the second row, there are like uh, kids and people the third row, it seems to be more noisy. There's like people in the stadium here, uh, people here that seem to be maybe dancing or yelling. So there's the idea here is that uh, they managed to capture some semantics and based on this self-supervised approach. Even more important, what they did, um, they ran this one of these uh, interpretive studies on a CNN. Uh, probably you, you saw in previous lectures of the course that what you can do is um, we can visualize the highest activations of some of the convolutional networks, of the neurons on the convolutional network. And they did that. So they, they look at, uh, they handpick some of the neurons in the CNN, in the network that was trained, and they, they realized, they identified how some of these neurons, they were kind of weak detectors for some semantic classes. So here you have, here you have some examples. Notice that these, la these labels that you can see over here, they were generated by the researcher after looking at the data. But what it's telling is that there is a neuron, so there was a neuron in this neural network that had high activations over uh, faces of babies. There was another different neuron in that network that had uh, highest activations over grass, the one over plants, the one over persons, and many others. So the message here is that even if there was no uh, explicit labeling, any explicit semantic labeling of the data set, some of the neurons that were trained in a totally self-supervised manner, they kind of learn to capture these semantics. And they actually they can, of course, if it's a commercial network, you, you have a kind of a notion of, of the central location where the, the neuron is, is being activated. Later, in a future work, what they did is instead of just uh, creating some energy-based statistics, uh, this very uh, similar team, what they did is um, now they, first they kind of improve a little bit the network. Now, instead of just having a commercial network to predict, like given a frame, uh, give you a, a, a fix, a static feature. Now they also fed Nelastian just to be able to, to analyze sequences of video frames. And now at the output, they were predicting something called Docker Calogram, which is uh, a special um, representation of audio in which you have in one dimension, you have uh, time, and another dimension, you have uh, frequencies, kind of. And again, that's something that uh, audio uh, engineers and uh, data scientists, they, they, they agree that that's a useful representation, that's something that you can compute, there's some formula that allows to compute that based on the frequencies. And as you can comp you can compute that, you can totally train a neural network that can predict, given a video frame, predict the kilogram that matches with this video frame. And also in addition, as there was an LSTM, uh, if we were feeding a, a video sequence, the predicted kilograms would have some temporal coherence. So that was the pretext tax. And again, this task by itself, it's kind of it's kind of used to this niche a little bit. And now what they did is uh, with these calograms, actually they use these calograms to, in a large data set, 
um, retrieve audio clips that were very similar to the, to the programs that were predicted for each video frame. So again, so they had a video frame. They uh, they predicted the cocardogram, and then they used this cocardogram to um, retrieve a real audio, an audio that had been recorded, but whose cocardogram was very similar to the one that was predicted by the convolution neural network. So in this case, it's not that the network is, is generating the sound, but it's generating a representation that we use to, to do the a search in a, on a data set. OK? So as they have like a sequence of video frames, they could predict a sequence of cocardograms, they could retrieve a sequence of audio clips, and they could, in the end, uh, you will see a result now in which they are uh, summarizing. So they are providing a sound that's not matching the sequence that you will see, but that it's kind of aligned, that it kind of looks natural. You see, okay? So now you see so, uh, some examples of video clips in which you will uh, hear the, the sound that they retrieve. Okay, so that's uh, the whole uh, structure that I was mentioning. So the, this last part is the audio clip retrieval that I was mentioning. Okay, so they bring the programs, they retrieve the, the waveforms, let's say. Let's listen to it. To help understand what our model's doing, we can look at the video clips in our database that it's transferring audio from. These are the audio clips whose sound features are most similar to those predicted by our model. Okay, so as you can notice probably when you, when you watch a video first, it looks kind of natural the audio you were listening, but actually you just uh, noticed that you were not listening to the audio that was actually recorded with those video frames. What if we do the opposite direction? What if now, instead of like going from pixels to audio, why don't we exploit these self-supervised learn uh, networks to go from audio to pixels? Let's see what we can do. So one of these uh, very popular architecture that actually was presented in Barcelona in, in Europe 2016, it's called SoundNet. So in this case, we are adopting a distillation approach. Uh, distillation approach it means that we have like some network that for some reason it has some privilege over other simpler networks as the teacher. In this case, our uh, teacher network is what we have here on top. And these are like convolutional networks that they have been trained with the labels from two data sets, from uh, the ImageNet data set that contains images of objects and the places data set that contains images of locations. They have been uh, trained in a supervised manner. Okay, so there's, there's some knowledge already embedded on these networks. And now what we're going to do is we're going to fit, uh, we're going to have a, a training data set of video, we're going to fit the video frames in both networks, so they would predict some distribution of classes. So there's going to be a softmax here at GM that will predict across the 1,000 classes of ImageNet, and I think also 1,000 on places. I'm not sure. I'm not fully sure if there were 1,000 or whatever amount of classes. So there's going to be distribution of labels, and now we are going to train this network, the SoundNet network. This network is going to learn features for audio. It's a convolutional neural network, one deep convolutional neural network, but it's going to uh, learn the features of, if we fit here at the input some raw waveform, a uh, window of some raw waveform, and we're going to extract features out of it. So the goal here is to have very good feature extraction for audio, and we want to train this network. We are going to train this network by uh, asking the network to predict the labels, the distribution of labels that are predicted by the vision network, by the teacher. 
So it's kind of a way of transferring the knowledge that we have, that we obtain from the, the visual modality into kind of the audio one. So we are going to uh, be generating labels, pseudo labels, pseudo labels for video, this video, which is unlabeled. And we are going to train this new network so that by just looking at the audio, it should predict the objects and the places that are present on the video. Okay. Clear so far, this architecture. Yeah, so we will learn. So we are training the network below, the one that it's on audio. And then these, these networks, they don't change, they are fixed. They are pre-trained. Good one. More pretty boy. Okay, now, uh, now you saw this video. Um, can you tell me what you just saw? Can you, whether on the microphone, which will be recorded on the chat, which will be anonymous, tell me like, what, what is the interest of this video? What are we seeing here? What, what do you think that we are seeing here? We'll make it a bit more easier, the question. Uh, so here there are like two sets of labels. Um, let's see, what do, why do you think there's some set of labels which are red, not some other ones which are blue? Then there's uh, some confidence score next to them. Why do you think they're like two different colors? Okay, I'm not really sure. If Okay, place and objects. Thank you very much. Uh, let's leave. Okay, so what the two colors, the red and blue, they refer to they refer to the the two teacher networks. So we have one network that is trained on objects, on ImageNet, another network that is trained on places. Okay, um, which one do you think it's for ImageNet, the red or blue one? Which one do you think it's pretty much not the red or blue? So imagine where objects, uh, places are for locations. Any idea? Blue, okay. So you see, if you look at the predictions here, they kind of look at more blues. Okay, then next thing, like at this point of the video, the, the pixels are totally blurred. Like why do you think that the authors of this video blurred the pixels? What's the, what's, the, what's the sense? Why, why did they blur the videos? I'm oh, sorry, the pixels. Any interest? No? So what's, what's the goal? Like, okay, let's, let's see the other way. So who is predicting this? Uh, this so here you have like two sets of classes in red and blue, and these are classes. So who is predicting these confidence scores and, and classes? So these are the top three predicted classes. Which network is predicting that from this, from this scheme? Which network is predicting uh, those labels? The ones that we, that we see in the video. There are only two options, okay? So whether the teacher or the student, I can even set up a... Okay, can you... So you, you need to, to take risk, okay? So who's creating those labels? Okay, Sonnet, okay, great. And why, so yeah, that's correct. Sonnet is creating that, and why is that? Why, why is it interesting? That it sounded. What does it make this research interesting now? So was sounded because it only uses only Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's 
again. Good lad. You're a busy boy. So the point is that all these predictions that you saw, they were based only on the audio, okay? And they were based on labels that were generated, pseudo labels were generated from the um, Imagine and Places CNNs that were trained in a supervised manner. Okay, so with this approach, uh, SoundNet obtained like some audio features that uh, look much better than the state of the art and that, that chime for uh, feature extraction and that kind of made also uh, an important breakthrough on the on the audio community, right? To to run features. Also, if you you can we can also visualize the features actually if you are into audio and if you look at the features on the first layer, which are what they were on the convolutions, they had this kind of uh, shapes, which kind of remind like some frequency detectors, right? So that's what you would expect. And also, if you if we go deeper and we do the same thing of trying to get the highest activations for on that convolutional layer, that convolutional layer we can see that uh, high activations of some of the neurons they actually also have some semantic uh, meaning or interpretation, similarly similar to what we saw earlier on on the previous example. More recently, there was this uh, work which is kind of advanced, but it follows the, the same strategy. In this work, what, what they did is they created a data set also of, of sounds and uh, videos. And in this case, they use a, a data, sorry, a camera that's called a cost acoustic optical camera. You can see it over here. And this camera, what it does is apart from capturing the pixels, it can also have like all these small dots you see here, they are, uh, they are like um, um, small microphones. So they can also capture more or less the spatial location of, of, the, of the rough spatial location of the sound. So they can locate the source of the sound specially. So with this data set, they train uh, kind of an, uh, an alternative or advanced version of uh, SoundNet or in some, with some variations. But again, that's, that's the same story. You have uh, your data set that uh, you know the labels. In this case, you have RGB like SoundNet and also the acoustic images. And with the predictions, then later you try, you train a new network in order to, to learn uh, better, uh, be even better audio features. Okay, let's look at an, another family of self-supervised learning approaches when combining pixels and audio. This one is more related to what uh, we have seen so far in previous uh, sessions, because now what we're going to do is to compare uh, pixels and audio clips and kind of define task in which we need to decide if they match or not, whether if they are, yeah, if they are match or not. Let's look now at the details because there are, there are different ways to understand what does match mean or not. So the first um, basic approach to do that, it's say, okay, we have a data set of videos, we have the, the pixels, we have the audio tracks, and then we want to learn some visual features, some audio features, these are, these are the details of the two, of the two um, networks. They are both like convolutionals. In our job, we have some fusion networks, fully connected network layers, which are these ones. And then what we do is we create a training data set in which we have like pairs of audio and um, pixels that match, that they are from the same clip, and pairs that don't. And what we have here on job is a softmax layer with just two outputs so that we predict whether they match or they don't match. It's kind of a binary verification task. And of course, we can really generate a huge amount of data with, with that pretext task. If we do that, we can learn uh, very use, very rich features. Here you have like uh, some examples of the activation of some of the features in this case on pool four on this uh, network, on the vision network. And you can see that again, like, what I'm showing here are for some specific uh, commercial neurons, I am plotting their highest activations, okay? And what you can see 
is that uh, in these examples, there are many more in, in the paper that some, there's, there's at least one neuron that, uh, or actually in the head there are two, there are at least like two neurons that they have high activations to detect heads of persons or faces, right? Even in, even if we never uh, train them like with any local annotation. This is totally self-supervised with the audio and, and, and visual tracks that we get from the videos. So even with that, we can really roughly localize uh, some semantics. We can do something similar. If we try to visualize things from the audio network. So in this case, again, what I'm doing is I'm looking at some of the um, pool four, I think it's this one, the pool four is this one layer and for some of these uh, neurons that activation that we have there i look at the highest activations and each of the columns corresponds to one different uh, let's say activation and i'm ranking like the the video frames that match the audio that produces the highest activations okay what we see here is that if we if go through uh, columns okay we must we must read this figure by columns that is that there is one uh, unit in that uh, pool four layer that it's kind of good at catching the sound of babies or children, or in this case, probably ladies or uh, men or male wolves. That one is really obvious if it's, it's labeled like that, or just people in general. So each of the columns they are different units. They are they have high activations for some mm, semantic concepts. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going just to focus in, I uh, think, two of, of these columns. And we are going to hear the, the sounds that activate the most uh, two of these neurons. Okay, that's in the, the next slide. So I will, I will mute myself, myself again. I will just play both of them. And you, you should see that um, there are some semantic correlation, I guess. Or you, you totally notice that there's some audio uh, similarity. Yeah, so you can notice that again, that would be like the, the equivalent of looking at visually the, the neurons, okay? But in this case, we must uh, listen to them. Other tasks that we can think about uh, on binary verification, for example, is just um, instead of just mixing uh, soundtracks that don't match the visual track, uh, we could do some misalignment. Okay, so even from the same let's say video clip, we take the waveform, but we don't uh, we don't do the, the comparison with the with the audio track that is aligned with that frame, but we just do some Randomly, we just do some misalignment, and then we ask the network to predict whether that sound is aligned or not. And again, we can uh, learn some very valuable features with that. More recently, for example, there was this work uh, last year in CEPR in which uh, they trained with some stereo sound. And that, so there was this lady, you can see the lady is uh, speaking in front of uh, two microphones. And then, um, it was moving from one side to another on the video clip, right? But when training the network, sometimes you were showing the same video clip, right? But just playing the, the audio track in the opposite direction, you can see that this is not much like the lady here is on the right, but the speaker is on the left. While over here, the lady is on the right, the speaker is also on the right. So you can also train on your network uh, to learn rich features also with this, this type of strategies, okay? With trying to, to match the visuals with the, with the source on the of, of, of channel-wise audio sources. Okay, more recently presented last week in NeurIPS, there's this work on that it's also based on binary verification, but this one is a bit more complicated, but I'll, I'll try to summarize it in a, in a minute. So same story as, as always, we want to learn some uh, visual encoder, some audio encoder. We have a large amount of uh, 
videos. But now what we're going to do is the following. We will start with, let's say, some random weights for our network, and we feed our video frames, our audio frames. What we do now is we generate um, clusters. Okay, so we run maybe some k-means. Uh, in this paper, they use k-means, so let's say some clustering algorithm in which you know how many clusters there are, and you just run it, and you build clusters. And based on these clusters, then you label the videos. So like as each of each of the audio and RGB frames will fall in one of these clusters, we can create labels for each of them. We can label them. And then we let's say now we freeze the clusters, we keep the labels, and now we um, we um, we train the neural network so that it predicts the right cluster for each of the of the video clips or audio or RGB frames. Okay, so we, we train the neural networks to uh, given the whether the RGB frames or the audio signal to predict the, the cluster, and that is a classification problem. Okay, so we are going to exploit the pseudo labels that we generate by doing the clustering. This will be like one iteration. Then instead of just doing this once, we do it in a loop. So we do that like for many, 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 many times. And at the end, we can learn. We will have, again, some uh, audio and video encoder. This setup, they call it just single modality deep clustering. That's not the best setup that they have, but that's but Maybe that's that the the spirit is is there because now what they're going to do they tried uh, different options. Um, they tried what if now uh, what I have is I try to backpropagate so that the both the encoder and the video encoder they predict both the labels for the that come from the visual and the audio parts that would be one option. They call it multi head deep clustering. They also tried. What if no? What if I concatenate the features? I cluster this concatenation of features, and now I create the pseudo labels. We call it concatenation deep clustering, and the one that works the best. Oops, sorry. It's that's called the cross model deep clustering. Just notice what they're doing. Now they have the RGB frames. They train. Sorry, they uh, get the clusters in for video, and now they ask the audio network to predict the pseudo label from the video part and vice versa, right? So they cluster the audio features and they ask the video network to predict the pseudo labels of the other network. When they do that, they obtain features which are mm, more transferable. So they are better when you transfer them to another task than the features that you obtain when you train even with fully supervised setups using the labels from ImageNet or Kinetics. Kinetics is a very large data set for video for, for video for action recognition. So basically here the story is that uh, also for video recognition, using this um, self-supervised approach provides, allows to learn richer um, features, which are in this case visual features, than uh, when we have the labels, the semantic labels of these two data sets. Okay. Also, of course, that the the videos that we're using here, they, they are so we assess with these two data sets. Are, these ones are very popular for this action recognition task, but we never train with this data. We're always using a different data sets of uh, comparable uh, sizes. Okay, so that's that's kind of a an important step because it's telling you that the best pre-trained features you can get used nowadays for video action recognition, they are actually pre-trained in a self-supervised manner. In this case, when I say self-supervised, I mean that I'm combining uh, the audio and visual features. Okay, and that's and that's important because uh, when I talk about these full supervised setups. ImageNet has no audio, and I think that when they refer to kinetics, they are they are not using uh, the audio features as well either. Okay, so that's that's important that here the audio is providing like some extra information. But that's but that's what I'm my point is that my whole point of the lecture is that if you have this data, if you have like some additional information that can enrich even your visual representations, 
try to use it. Okay, moving to contrastive methods, which is more closer to what uh, you saw uh, in the previous lectures. So remember, in contrastive uh, methods, what we will have, we're going to have like pairs or triplets of samples, and we're going to try to uh, make them closer or, or apart in the feature space. So now we are trying to move the feature, right? Get them closer or, or, or apart. Remember, I think that Yanis already showed this slide on me as well, uh, that that's how contrastive learning works. And for example, there was this uh, first work or this first setup that kind of shows that if you want to learn, uh, you have uh, visual and audio features from a clip, right? Or from two clips in this case, clip I, clip and clip J. Um, typically what you do, and what I think what I have shown so far in the previous examples that I show is that, okay, you, you could try just to do if they, uh, this binary verification, if they are from the same clip, you say they are right. If they are not, you say they are wrong. So in this work, they show that actually that's not the best solution. Uh, that what you should do is you, you should, so instead of having like some verification, binary verification, it's better to apply some contrasting uh, learning. The feature will, will get better, okay? Just try to uh, attract the features that are from the same video clip and um, push away the features that are from other clips. Okay, so this work actually they do something better later, but it's coming in, in a few slides. This is some, somehow what we did uh, some years ago now with Didac Turis and Amanda Duarte uh, here at UPC. Um, we had a data set called YouTube 8 million and we extract, oh, so the, they will provide also uh, some visual and audio features and we train a new network that was uh, that's it, putting uh, together the feature from the same videos and putting apart the feature from audio videos. And we use that to solve uh, what's called the uh, image of retrieval uh, problem, like similar to the one that you saw earlier from the from the, from the heat sticks. So what we had is we, maybe we had some the pixels, we uh, extract the feature that correspond to those pixels, and then we go on to the train uh, data set, sorry, to the test data set, and do a search. It means that we compare the features we extracted with all the features from the test data set, but that we had extracted only by looking at the audio. So in other words, what it is, we, we did a ranking of the images in the, our test data set based on the similarity of the visual features that we extracted from our query, which, which in the example I'm, say, I'm saying, it's it's come from pixels. And then we did the opposite. We did queries with audio and then retrieve uh, videos based on their visual features. Notice that here we train our network just so that both audio and visual features, they should kind of map to the same place. Let's look at some a couple of, of results. Okay. I didn't remember there were like two videos. Uh, so you will see uh, on the right, you will see that uh, this example that you'll see now, um, there's a, the query is with the audio, you see it on the right. Very small, you see the video that you will be actually uh, listening at. And then the large image that you see, that's the video that we'll read, the most similar video based on the features we that we compared. Okay, now I will mute myself. Hola, ahora voy a hacer unas flautas de pollo. Aquí ya tengo mi pollo cocido y deshebrado. Lo cocí con cebolla, cilantro y tomate, tomate rojo. Y ahora vamos a empezar. Aquí tengo mis tortillas, tortillas de maíz. I thought maybe now you can hear me well. Just write on the text if you don't hear me well. I did you hear me, okay? That's, I think, I just for my speakers down. Uh, so now what you, what you are seeing now, 
is like okay. in the left the video that we run the query with but you are actually uh, hearing the video to watch with me. And as you can see, it kind of um, makes sense, right? The, the one that you, you semantically, it makes sense. There's somebody talking about the recipe. If you speak Spanish, if not they're talking about the recipe and you see a lady that is uh, cooking something. Visually, the lady doesn't seem to, to be speaking Spanish, not in the original video, it doesn't, but it's kind of related to two cooks and, and the kind of sounds and kind of tone of, of the, of the video that kind of makes sense. Cool. I would appreciate if you tell me on the chat if you can hear me well together with the audio of the video. Thanks. Okay, that's much better now. Cool. Um, so, as I mentioned, that, that previous paper that I, men uh, that I mentioned, they have something uh, better than, so I, I talk about this instance based a bit, which it's better than just doing the binary verification. And then here they, they propose a different uh, setup, which it's kind of related to this clustering thing. So this idea of clustering and then do the similarity with the clusters, it seems to work really well. We have seen it in, in various solutions on self-supervised learning. So in this case, what they do is um, they have, um, okay, so they look at the similarities between samples on the audio and on video. And then it's not that they, they just consider the positive set is uh, audio or video that it's in the same video clip. It's more relaxed. Now they, they consider that a positive set are all the uh, pairs of samples that for whose audio and video, they are kind of similar. Okay, so now it's not that just that the green can only be matched with the green, it can, also, it can also be matched with the blues and then it's going to also going to be a positive. Uh, sample, so it's, it's yeah, I think it's kind of more relaxed, right? Because you can you can have like videos which are very similar, and and you don't want to just to push them away when you when you are doing the contrasted learning. And when they do that, when they say okay, now I'm going also to allow that, let's say like when I compare this blue, uh, sorry, this green uh, sample with this blue one, I just even if they are from different videos, if they are already similar in my iterative learning process because it's a bit iterative, I will, I will, I will strengthen that they are uh, together because they are similar both in audio and both in video, so probably they are, they are really similar. And then just the negative parts, it's, it's the same. And that works even better if you want to try. Look at this second part of the lecture on self-supervised audiovisual learning. Now in this second part, we'll not be focusing so much in trying to learn features for another downstream task, but we will really try to look at tasks that whose aim is really to go from one modality to another. Let's see some of these examples. So we'll call this cross modal translation in the sense that we go from one modality to audio or, or visual to the other modality. So let's start with, first with the that, uh, solutions that go from sound to vision. So we have some input audio and we want to generate pixels from that audio. So there have been uh, a few attempts to do that. Uh, this one is one of the preliminary ones. Basically, uh, again, they try to train a, a neural network, in this case, a, a GAN, JT Fiber Cell Network. And when you obtain is, uh, you see on, on the, there are like two columns, the ones on the left are the pixels that were generated from the audio tracks. And on the right, you see the real image. So you can see that it may be true that there's some relation between one another, but it's the quality of this work, at least it wasn't that judge that big. That's that basically tells you that it's quite a hard task to model, to just try to hallucinate, to imagine images from sound. That's a, a tough task for uh, the architectures. This one maybe is slightly better, I'm sure. In this case, they use a popular GAN called StackGAN. If you remember, I think we saw it when we talk about Trinity Fiber Cell Networks, it had like two stages. So they use this first stage of StackGAN, and then they fit some audios here. Uh, sounds of train, that's what the network hallucinated. Sounds of firework, okay, it's kind of darkish image. Guitar, I mean, it's not realistic, but probably we may think that, that semantically, we will probably be able to say that there's kind of, looks to be somebody playing the guitar 
and dog. Maybe this one's more challenging. And this one, I think, is a bit uh, more recent, uh, so from 2019, but similar approach. And, and again, like the quality, it's it's not that perfect. But remember, that's quite a, a challenging task. I mean, probably there are probably, uh, there are better architectures that now this could do it better. But that's the kind of thing that that people have tried. So just to imagine to hallucinate pixels just from raw audio, just from the sound of a dog or drums or piano or a plane. One of the latest work here, just that you are aware of the state of the art, is this one. So this was presented this year in, in ECCV, which is one of these top conferences on computer vision. Uh, in this case, they use uh, these transformer architectures um, to try to learn the distribution of uh, features um, between the uh, visual and audio features. Okay, And then uh, it was predicting new frames on a video sequence. So now it's we are not just predicting one image, but we are trying to read a sequence of images. And this this work, it was like really, really narrow in the sense that it was really focusing on very simple sequences. Uh, if you can see this sequence, this frame, this is a ground truth frame. This will be a generated frame. You can already see that it looks kind of blurry of this video frame. And uh, this sequence is a static camera that it's uh, pointing at uh, a player, a drum player uh, from both. And then the idea here is that when whatever it's it's hitting the drums, that you get some motion that's related to that to that mo to that uh, motion of, of the musician. Here you can see like some of the examples. And again, it's not very spectacular, but it's that's where the state of the art is today. So imagine that you you have like that you have a network that has seen some frames. So this would be like one, two, three frames. So again, imagine, I mean, imagine, you, you must understand that we are, look, we are looking at a drum player. This is the, the hand of the drum player. And there are the drums, OK? And the hand is just hitting different uh, drums. So there's a sound associated. And this will be like, in this case, in this example, what the network has seen, this will be like the previous sequence, the previous frames that it has seen. And now it should hallucinate about the next ones. And that's what you see here on the right. These are all frames that were uh, hallucinated based on the sound. So you feed the, the sound, the audio track, and, you, and it generates the audio features. So uh, I, think it's the, I think this is the ground truth. Yeah, the one you have here on top is the ground truth. And the, the ones you have below, it's the generated frames. OK, so maybe you can see that. It's, what is interesting is that. If you notice the location, at least of this hand, it matches this one. Although it's very, very conclusive, and more important that here, this what it calls like GT flow. Flow, flow. It's a, it refers to the optical flow. So it's a way of encoding uh, motion of the pixels. Okay. So each each of these colors, so each of, of these sequence is paired with the one on top, and each color it it indicates a uh, motion of a pixel in a certain direction. So depending on, on the color, uh, there's a different angle in which the pixel was shifted. And here where it's kind of showing us that more or less the location of the of the motion that we have in the ground truth, it kind of matches to the to the motion that was predicted on the generated image. Okay, which basically it, it follows the hand. So again, notice that this is the arm. Okay. I don't know if you can notice see and the, the chopstick here like that it's playing the drums so what so again not super impressive but it kind of tell you that that's a, there's a lot of work here to do if, if you just go from just raw audio and you just try to generate pixels that's that's really hard task so there are ways to kind of work around it and that would be the case, this case of this work in this work they Kind of simplify the problem now they are not trying just to generate raw pixels from raw audio but they say okay let's make it a bit easier and are we going going to introduce in between some simplified representation in particular i'm going to uh, know that in this case there's uh that the audio refers to uh, piano music and i'm going to model the upper uh, part of the body the the arms and hands of the player with the key points. Okay, so that's what we are going to be predicting. Where the network here it does not predict the pixels. What it predicts is how the positions of the joints uh, are evolving in time. 
And how do you do that? We fit uh, some audio features into an LSTM, so a recurrent neural network. And this recurrent neural network will generate a sequence of joints of body parts. So this, that's a part that the network that we learn. Once we have that, we can, with the predicted uh, joints, we can animate an avatar and finally generate the video sequence. Yeah, let's look at the results. Uh, this work. So now you can see like the final uh, result, but notice that what the network is, is actually predicting uh, is are the joints. So there's a question saying like, if is the frame rate supposed to be slow? Okay, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a video stream here. Uh, as you have the slides, I suggest that you can just click directly in the slides and figure out if there's some problem okay, with the frame rate, because I'm not sure if the, if the video call is kind of slowing things down. Okay, cool. So that would be one way to work around this really hard task of creating pixels from audio. Let's look at other solutions. There are some solutions that actually what they're going to do is they're going to kind of generate pixels. And you see that what I mean pixels more like on the spatial location of the audio in the video sequence. Let's see what I mean with that. So if you remember maybe from uh, the, the other part of the uh, session of the lecture, we saw a work in which they were uh, learning features by comparing images uh, from a video frame. So video frames with uh, audio. And they were uh, trying to predict if, if they were matching or not. These were the, 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 the matching network, I call it. But matching in the sense that uh, the network was supposed to predict if there was a match or not, OK? And with that, uh, you could learn very uh, good and rich features. Then there's a, another way also uh, to look at that, which is like uh, if we have a neural network that here in the end, at the output, we have a convolutional case. So at this point, so if all the network is convolution, now we, don't, we will not have uh, kind of fully connected layers anywhere. Uh, so we will be able to kind of um, maintain the spatial uh, information across the whole network. And just look what we're there doing. Um, they are kind of uh, comparing over the, 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 the audio features with the convolutional features. When I meant that we all use the convolutional features, I mean, for the pixels part, OK? And now at this point, we have a convolutional tensor, not put, uh, sigmoid. And then on top, I do a max pool of this sigmoid output, and then I try to predict yes or no. And that's something we can train, OK? It's a, again, it's a binary classification task, uh, matching chart. Same as before, I just change uh, the architecture. By doing that, when it predicts uh, yes and no, especially when it predicts yes, uh, we can look at, in the previous layer, uh, tensor, which spatial locations were responsible for that prediction that the, that the matching was correct. So we can have like a rough spatial um, kind of attention map or uh, activation map telling you like when it's deciding that yes, that there's a good matching, it can tell you like which parts of the uh, of the of the spatial uh, distribution of the data are responsible for that prediction. Okay, and that's what we're going to visualize. We're going to visualize now for for uh, for uh, when we are feeling like the 
the uh, pairs of, of uh, video uh, frames and, and audio tracks. We fit them into a network that was trained to distinguish between if they were matching or not. Then now we're going to look at the activations that we obtain, uh, the highest activations we obtain. That will tell us uh, which part of the network uh, that, um, is, is focusing on, on the input data to make the predictions. So we have be able to have like this kind of saliency maps that across one video sequence we have here on as columns, we'll have a heat map. And the heat map, it corresponds to the maximum activation. Okay, so this, you see there's a, a violin player over here. There are like two violin players here with two heat maps. Uh, this seems to be a drum player, I think, and a guitar player. We'll see a video now of it. Okay, let's let's listen to the, to the video, watch the video. Let's see how you can see the mouth focusing on the mouth, right? Go from one side to another, it's the direction of violence, not playing. And you can see basically that there's a rough location of, 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 the, of the source sound, it's not actually of, of the sound. Uh, other things you can do. Um, what if the audio that we process is not just the the audio that, that sound that is generated by the objects, but it's a sound that we generate? And that's what if this sound it's actually like an uh, uh, echo? Uh, you mean like a kind of a brother thing? Okay. So what we do is we we generate an audio signal, and we uh, look at the echoes on two different sensors. Here it talks about the left ear and right ear. So what we're going to do is to generate a pulses of echo. We're going to have like two sensors, okay? And we are going to uh, kind of uh, have this network that will be trained in the end. Uh, with this network, we will be able to focus, to introduce this into the uh, a network, and a unit network that will, in the end, predict the depth. But this depth will be basically conditioned by the audio signal that we capture. Okay, so it, it's kind of going to be like a radar, or like uh, a bat would work on, on in order to estimate the, the depth. So let's see, see how how this can work. You will see the, the radar, okay, now? You will hear a, a pulse. And what you see on the left now, it's kind of the depth that's being estimated. It's combining, remember that it's combining the RGB pixels uh, with the audio. And it's kind of changing the view on the left. It changed from the depth to the pixels. Yeah. How, what if we look at the other way around? What if we go from, now from vision to sound, try to predict uh, sounds from vision? So that's the, the next setup we are going to address. So imagine now that what we have is a video of somebody who's playing the piano. And what we want to do is to predict uh, the play, the, 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 the music that it's being played. In particular, in this work, what they are going to make is not, again, the rough audio music, but they are going to predict the MIDI transcription. Uh, maybe you are aware that MIDI is a way of uh, transcribing uh, electronic music. So this transcription is going to be um, produced by uh, stacking uh, different kind of video frames. In this case, it's going to be a crop, regular crop over uh, the keyboard of a piano. And here at the output, you can see it's uh, predicting a, a classification of 88 binary classifiers, one for each piano key. So it's kind of predicting the, the keys. Okay, so let's see how it works. Let's 
So this, this what you hear now, it's only predicted from the uh, video, okay? Which, okay, I'm not an expert in piano, but if any of you are, I think at least it looks similar to the first uh, clip that we hear, right? So they kind of look similar. Can we make it a bit more complicated? Uh, yeah, we can. So what if instead of doing going to do piano, let's try to address other instruments. For example, what, what if we uh, deal with um, violins? In this case, in this work, again, the output is going to be the MIDI output, okay? So it's going to be a very discrete output. And the input is going to be the video, but again, uh, we were going to first use some key point extractor. These are tools that already exist that provide the joints of the human body. And that's what we are going to uh, use to um, predict the, the video, okay? So let's listen to the result. This one's not very spectacular, actually. As you can see, it's not that it's that it, the problem is solved, but at least there's some progress made, and and that it it kind of explains that shows that it's kind of feasible to predict something. Probably we, there's, a, there's some room for improvement, but the idea and concept is really interesting. What if now uh, what we want to do is uh, to, what if we have at the input, we have like uh, video, but and sound, and we're basically going to do is to try to separate sounds. So it's kind of this cocktail party problem, right? So imagine now that what we have then it's, um, not only one uh, player, one musician, we're going to have like different musicians. Again, so we are going, in this case, we're going to use the pixels, but we are also going to use the, the extracted body points. This, so these body points, again, they are automatically extracted. They are not perfect, but they are pretty good, okay? In this case, we're going also to train this network that allows to improve the prediction of the, of the human poses altogether. And at the output, we'll be, able to, uh, given the mixed waveform with all the musicians, to kind of be able to separate, so to discriminate between the each of the different performers with this network, okay? And everything, again, it's, it's trained completely and in a supervised manner. So we are going to be separating the uh, different players, the audio of the different players. Okay, so now that we know how that we can really separate the audio uh, from different music musicians, let's say, in a video stream, why don't we try to do just separate everything? Why don't we try to separate both the pixels and both the audio, okay? And everything all together in a self-supervised manner. So that's the idea of this uh, other work, that what they do is like, again, in a, in a self-supervised manner, if we have like the, the mix audio, of some maybe some male speech and some church bill you want to separate and here you see like one collective result which you which have the spectrograms of the church bell and the predicted spectrum of the church bells which looks at least visually 
quite reasonable. And here, if uh, from this spectrogram in this uh, word that I cite below, we separate them. Here you have the mill speech and the ground truth and the predictive, which visually they also look very uh, reasonable. Remember that here, where what we, in this world what they do is they uh, separate not only the audio but also the the pixels. Separating the pixels is what it's uh, commonly known as uh, image segmentation or object segmentation, which means like um, pixel-wise labels. That's a very hard task, but still they achieve like kind of reasonable-ish uh, results. What do we see? Let's look at the, this for example. In this column, we have the ground truth. And there's going to be uh, uh, two musicians playing, OK? And in this case, if we just focus in one of the musicians, this will be in red, you see the, the mask that will be predicted for one of the two uh, audio tracks. Okay, so this will be the ideal mask. This is like the, the predicted mask. It's not perfect, but notice that this was trained in a totally unsupervised manner. There are no, there was not trained with any uh, mask, any annotated mask. It was not supervised. There was only just the road video. So here, if you wanted to, uh, to segment the, the ground truth of the guitar, that would be the perfect segmentation. And that's what this technique kind of change, which roughly locates the guitar, which is good. It's kind of very similar to what we saw earlier on that word that was creating a heat map on the around the location of, of the object. But it's pretty good. I mean, it kind of roughly lo locates the, the object, which is um, really nice for a zero annotation cost. Something else you can do is, um, in this case, what they do is they uh, generate um, the features and the audio. In order to do that, they apply something called uh, cycle learning, which means that what is, in order to train that, what you do is you have the, uh, say you have your, some input image, then you try to separate the, the, the audio out of it, and then when you have uh, separated to generate the audio that comes from that image, then you try to reconstruct the image that you used to uh, predict the audio. On the other way around, you start with some audio, you try to generate the image, and then you try to reconstruct the audio that you use to generate that image. Like the result in this example is not um, very impressive, but this concept of cycle, cycle learning, which means that you go from one modality to, to another, so from audio to pixels, and then in order to train that, what you do is you try to go back to audio, and as you know, the, you have the source audio, you can back propagate, or the other way, you can start with pixels, you predict the audio, and then you try to go back to the pixels and you back propagate from the reconstructed pixels. This cycle learning, that's also a, quite a popular paradigm. Okay, just to finish, um, my, my opinion or my view on, on this field on self-supervised learning, I think it's, it's very interesting um, when connected with task or that may be used for control tasks for robotics to kind of, uh, to, that agents can learn about the environment in a self-supervised manner so they get used to the rooms they are, they are living in. And that's, there's this committee called Embodied AI, which I think it's really addressing to this field. So there's a huge amount of works on, on this field. One of them is I'm going, just going to highlight this um, simulator, I would say. Earlier, I showed this example of the, this radar that was predicting the depth. And maybe some of you like wonder how that model was trained because it's not that obvious to, um, to collect data uh, in a large scale with the depth and the echoes, okay? So here the idea is that if we are going to train, um, let's say embodied agents, let's say reinforcement learning agents, and we're going to collect data, but in a way in which the agent can develop, and we want that agent to to be able to use both the vision uh, sensor, both the camera in the real world, and both the uh, audio, audio tracks, the, the simulator should include both uh, modalities. So we, we would need simulators that are able to both generate pixels, synthetic pixels, but are also able to generate synthetic audio. And only with these simulators, we can uh, train agents that can make use of both modalities. And this one of these uh, environments that was presented this year again, 
called some spaces. So nowadays there are quite a few environments which are very realistic uh, visually in terms of like, especially indoors navigation, like in, inside houses or, or, or buildings. But uh, as far as I know, this is the only one that apart from simulating the pixels, it's also simulating the, can also simulate the sound. And I think that's very important if we are trying to train uh, agents that can, uh, can can exploit both the visual and the audio tracks. So here you have an example of it, how it works. So you can you can hear the, the fire alarm and how the closer you get to the fire higher alarm, the louder the sound is. And here in, in this task, this agent managed to found to find the fire alarm just by looking to navigate okay into the into the room just by um, listening so trying to understand how the audio uh, signals and the pixel signals okay just this this red uh, uh, wave of course that the agent is not seeing that it, that's for us to understand that the source is there but the agent is kind of capturing the the audio that's what you are hearing in the in the, in the track So I would say, as I was saying, I think that that's kind of the one of the most promising uh, directions. I would say that if you like uh, vision, I think that you should also like or should also try to learn about audio uh, processing because these are two models are, are really very cheap to acquire. They are very rich in a semantic manner. And if we are thinking about the that's it, robots or embodied agents, it's very easy that that they will have uh, both sensors, right? I think that probably like any commercial robot that if we think about robots that are going to interact with people, they are going to have um, microphones so that we can address them, so that humans can naturally talk to them. And if they are, can capture our voice, they can also capture all these ambient sound, okay? Uh, I know that in, in this lecture, I didn't talk about uh, language, language and speech, which is totally related, but that's, that's another story. We can cover that in another lecture. Okay, so I'll stop the recording now.